Hey, welcome to another episode of the Zach Hiley Show. Today, I have the pleasure and honor of being with Dr. Zhao Qi Zhang, who's an emergency medicine doctor here at Thomas Jefferson University. So Dr. Zhang is the assistant professor and assistant clerkship director of emergency medicine at Thomas Jefferson University. He is a triple graduate from Tufts University, and he completed his residency at Brown University. Dr. Zhang is a teacher, a loving father, a devoted husband, and a vocal advocate for the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, or AAPI. He has won multiple teaching awards, received numerous national educational grants, and he is one of the national leaders in advising medical students in emergency medicine. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. So as we always start, I'm going to go over a couple of statistics, and then I'll ask you if any of the statistics stand out to you, and you want to mention, like, that sounds kind of weird, or that makes sense to me. So starting off with entering resident characteristics. So the step one score of the average entering USMD person, so overall average, is 232. For emergency medicine, it's 233. The step two score average is 245 overall compared to 247 for emergency medicine. Training is usually about three years. Salary-wise, the average salary of a physician overall in America of MD is 339000 The average academic medicine associate slash full professor median salary in emergency medicine is 333000 Hours-wise, the average physician works 51 hours a week. The average emergency medicine doc works 46 hours a week. In a 2020 burnout report, it said the general burnout percentage was 48% among all physicians. And emergency medicine actually won that competition at the top at 60%. uh, And their most reported complaint was too many bureaucratic tasks. At the bottom of that list was public health and dermatology with 26% and 33% respectively. So do you have any thoughts on those statistics or any surprising or any not so surprising? I'm surprised that public health is doing so great in the setting of COVID. Yeah. It's very impressive. It's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, You know, I would say that I've been in academics for quite some time and being the assistant clerkship director, I, I am aware of a lot of the data, although with step one being pass and fail, I think that number, the previous numbers for step one for joining residency is going to change a lot Mm -hmm. from pass to fail or fail to pass. And I think the emphasis might be more towards step two, but more data to come. Yeah. Perspective. Yeah. Um, In terms of salary, I think that's always, you know, it's always a tricky subject because a lot of it is based on whether you are in academic versus community city versus suburbs. Um, And I think there's a great variation just with all those factors in place. Uh, but I will say that I'm not surprised that we are unfortunately number one in terms of burnout. I will say that I consider myself the least burnout or one of the least burnt out positions uh, for a multitude of reasons. But I can see that just with the tolls of everything um, with COVID compounded on that, that we have a hard job and I like what I do, but I have to face the facts. The facts are there. Yeah. Yeah. So what is emergency medicine? You want the Wikipedia definition or what do I think emergency medicine is? Give me both. Give me the give me the Wikipedia, the the, the layman definition and what you think emergency medicine actually is. So I'll give you the hybrid. How's that? Okay, sounds perfect. I, I think emergency medicine is the art of resuscitation, stabilization, and a little bit of family medicine all combined into one. Um we don't say no to everyone. Or sorry, we don't say no to anyone. Um, we treat everyone to the best of our abilities. And with every patient visit, whether it's a stub toe, a heart attack, or a stroke, our job is to say, did we stabilize you? Are you safe to go home? Or do we need to keep you and make sure that everything's okay? Um, you know, we are the gatekeepers. We are the folks that do triage and say, are you sick versus not sick? And that job responsibility just... It's, it's really hard to put into words. Now, of course, if you actually go into dictionary.com or what, Wikipedia, they'll do it a better job. But I think that we are, you know, we're the jack of all trades. And we try to dabble in a little bit of everything. Yeah. And that's emergency medicine. Yeah, that's it. And the thing I think of, or the thing I thought of as an emergency medicine doctor before I came into medical school, is the person in the emergency room. Is that always what an emergency medicine doctor is? The person in the emergency room? Or are they in diff- can they be in different jobs? elsewhere doing jobs, not necessarily only in the emergency room? Um, I think that's a 
a trickier question because I think in the setting of COVID, COVID yeah. has changed the rules of the game. Okay. You know, there are emergency doctor, emergency department doctors who are uh, operating urgent cares, who are doing telemedicine. And part of that is to do everything that we can to reduce the amount of overboarding or crowding in the emergency department. And our jobs, our training makes us highly versatile. You know, we can do a lot of things in the patient service, in the outpatient service, in the digital service. We can, we can offer a lot. Um, now I will say that many of us may feel most comfortable in the emergency department working with our nurses, our techs, the entire hospital staff. Um, but you know, I would say that we're, we're capable, mm -hmm. put us anywhere. We'll, we'll figure something out. So have you found yourself doing more telemedicine things and stuff like that since COVID? Uh, I found myself pivoting a lot to support our telemedicine department. Okay. Um, I will say that I still do telemedicine from time to time, but mostly my time is spent in the emergency department as a clinician and also as a teacher. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, now on to the question, the question about why emergency medicine. So a lot of students, you know, they they think about maybe they know when they first come in the first year, but usually I think most people solidify their decision around third year of medical school. When did you know you wanted to be an emergency medicine doctor? So I always tell this story. Actually, I just had a meeting with one of my med students yesterday about their pursuit into emergency medicine or their hesitant hesitance in pursuing emergency medicine. And I always tell them my story is when I started medical school, I was 120% on the primary care boat. I joined all of the family medicine interest groups. I went to their national conferences and I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, but emergency medicine is weird. It's one of those jobs that chooses you, but not the other way around. And during one of my out, it's like an OB rotation, I had an, uh, an away rotator, an audition student who I met maybe once or twice. And after just seeing me in action for one or two shows, she came up to me and told me point blank and said, Tony, I don't, I don't think you're cut out to be a primary care person. You seem much more active, slightly fidgety. And uh, have you thought about emergency medicine? And, and at that point, I was, I was insulted. I was like, what do you mean emergency medicine? Those downstream doctors, none of that preventative stuff, you know, over utilizer resources. This is preposterous. Um, but I did take it to heart because when I was doing family medicine and, and, you know, bless those physicians, they work so hard. They, they have so many things they need to do. Um, I, I didn't find myself at home when I was doing that rotation. And I, and I really tried to make myself like it. I said, no, this is what I wanted to do. Absolutely. I set myself on this track. I have to do it. But when I decided to take her words into consideration, I took a week off. I shadowed in the emergency department. And from that one week exposure, realized that there was a whole different side of medicine that I didn't know. And I loved it. I, I love being in the forefront of medicine. I loved providing care to people who you know, didn't know what kind of medi medical processes they had, right? I was able to learn how to establish rapport in a quick period of time. And to be honest, it was, it was very rewarding, you know, to see that somebody can come in with a problem, big or small, and you are able to make a dent in that. And, and that felt very rewarding. And you know, certainly we saw, I saw a lot of acuity, like different levels of acuity during that shadow shift or shadow month process. But I liked it so much that I decided to pivot my career completely. Mm. And I do not regret it. Since then. So it was a it was a click. It was a, as soon as you stepped onto that emergency medicine room, started seeing those patients as a med student, you're like, I knew this this is for me. Yeah. And wow. and I think part of it is um when I was in family medicine, I I felt burdened by the frustration of you as a physician would tell patients suggestions, recommendations, and I took it personally when every time they just were not able to adhere to the recommendations due to a multitude of complex socioeconomic issues. Of course, I was in attending. I learned that 
those are there for a reason. Um, but when I was a learner, I, I just felt so, so frustrated. I was like, oh my gosh, you're coming in again. Your hba one c is higher. Your blood pressure is so high. I feel like if I meet you again in a month, we're just going to do this again. It felt very challenging. Once again, God bless those doctors who are doing such an amazing job. And when I was in emergency medicine rotation slash during that shadow week, I realized that it's okay. You know, these patients, whatever hardships that they endured, whatever challenges they had in getting those medications, when they're with me, you know, we'll start with a clean, like, blank slate. I'll take care of you no matter what happened. You know, whatever hardships you had, whatever unfortunate circumstances, I'm there, right? No judgments. It's a judgment-free zone. I'll take care of you and we'll go from there. And, and I felt that lifted a lot of kind of that judgmental burden that some people may have in the non-medical world. In the medical world, when you're in the emergency department, everyone's the same. You can be the CEO, you can be the custodian, you can be a famous sports player. I don't care. Like We're all on the same page. I'm going to be your doctor and I'm going to take care of you. And if I can't take care of you, someone else will figure it out um, and we'll get that done immediately. Everything is stat, right? If I worked as hard, you know, I'm going to make sure that something good happens at the end of the day. And I and I just felt that to be, I don't know, just just being in that clinical environment provided such a, a rush of excitement and it really made me remember why I wanted to be a doctor in the first place is to to be there for someone when they need it. And I think that's emergency medicine. Yeah. It's interesting because you because you did did you have a required emergency medicine rotation in third year or no? No. So yeah. emergency medicine as a core requirement really started becoming a commonplace in the last few years or so. Yeah. So traditionally emergency medicine, I mean, as a field, we're still very young. Mm -hmm. But we I think we just started offering, don't quote me in terms of the data is wrong, but like a few years ago, we started offering emergency medicine as a core rotation, as a third-year medical student. Traditionally, it's an elective. Mm -hmm. So most people will have to know they're interested in emergency medicine before they even start. So for me, I had to take the, take the chance, take a week from my vacation and to explore this, which ultimately made a big difference in terms of my career choices. Yeah. It's interesting because you said something that I've, I've heard a couple times now, um, that someone told you, you know, you should look into this and not look into this. And Mike, I guess I'm wondering, what do you do if you're a student that someone hasn't told you, you know, you're meant to do this or you're meant to do that? Because I don't know, no one's ever really, I guess someone told me once that I should go into this. But I wonder if you would have ever discovered emergency medicine if, you know, that OB person didn't say, you know what, I don't think you should be in primary care. I think you should go into emergency medicine. You, do you think you would have discovered it still anyway? Or? I don't think so. Yeah. I think I've just been very unhappy as a primary care doctor. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that's interesting, right? I would have done it and been unhappy with it. And it shows the power that you have as a teacher, right? Because it's these chance scenarios, these chance interactions that could change the course of someone's entire career, right, as a student. And I don't know, it always makes me wonder, did I not, because I've never tried ENT, I've never tried orthopedic surgery, you know, these kind of these other things. And I wonder, maybe that was the thing that I wanted to do, but no one's ever talked to me or told me about that. I don't know, it's a random, random kind of thing to think about. No, I, I think, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. I would say that the one take, take home message from my story is keep your, keep your options open. Yeah. Even for those who I mentor specifically, we at Jefferson have a very um, organized faculty student mentor process. So mm -hmm. if you know you're interested in emergency medicine, we will pair you up with one of the clerkship directors. We will read your CVs, help you write your personal statements, look at your rank list. Like we will follow you every step of the way. And even in those very dedicated like EM focused students, I will still tell them, by the way, keep your options open because mm -hmm. you never know when you just say yes to something and that will change your life completely. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of this will lead into a different conversation. We've seen a lot of people drop off from emergency medicine. Um, you know, if you look at the data from the match this year, there's a significant drop from the previous years, whether it's COVID, whether it's burnout, whether it's turnovers, there's, the costs are plenty. And there's numerous articles on annals of emergency medicine that talk about the, the futures of emergency medicine as a field, which I don't think this podcast might, yeah. might be, uh, it would be too long of a podcast uh -huh. to go over that concept. But, you know, I think it's important that from the student's perspective, just keep things open because yeah. you never know. What, 
this is I, maybe we'll we'll sidestep for a second here. Why why is this ha- is this because why are they saying that people aren't applying that much into? Is it there's not as many students applying into emergency medicine residency? There's the turn, or I guess this is what you're saying. They're not really sure. So just objectively, yeah, there are fewer medical students applying to emergency medicine. Uh. There is an unprecedented number of unfilled spots where in previous years, emergency medicine residencies had to, the students who are going into it had to go through the, um, like the soap process Mm -hmm. of finding a spot because they couldn't match into emergency medicine. Um, And I think the causes of that are multifactorial. And yeah, it's, it's an interesting process. Yeah. And I think um, I'm hoping that uh, like all things, it'll just like ebb and flow and maybe we're just, we're at one of the lows and it'll get high again. Who yeah. knows? Yeah, that's interesting. What was um, residency like for you? So I love my residency yeah. program. As I don't know if the, the listeners can see, but I'm yeah. still wearing my favorite life yeah. pack jacket. Talk about your jacket. What is your jacket? So my my it's uh, got badges. It's got this, it looks like a star. What is that? A, a man in there? No. So this this is actually a, a PPE kachu. So <laughs> it is a pin. I got this in the in the beginning of COVID. Um, you know, there's no product endorsement. I just happen to have it. PPE kachu. PPE kachu. That is genius. Um, I have a few other Pokemon pins on my white coat. Oh, sorry, my uh, my blue scrubs here. I have some on my white coat, and that's why I have too many on my white coat. Um, but this jacket is uh, kind of a gift because I did a lot of what's called life pack. It's a critical care transport pr- uh, service uh, that was offered at our institution where we trained. And, and the whole process is that there are patients sometimes that are too sick. And those patients need higher level of care. And for those uh, patient transports, often a physician is on board one of those um, like critical care transport ambulances to provide emergent care and resuscitation as needed. You know, it's not uncommon for patients to get chest tubes in there or start chest compressions or pericardiocentesis. It's just wow. those patients are really sick. And one of the opportunities for my residency program, and given that I'm a few years out, so in case this information is inaccurate, just <laughs> due to time, you know, we got to ride on that, the ambulance, for, for lack of a better word, as an opportunity to get more exposures to, to patient transfers. So I, I did a few of those shifts. I love working with the, the life, pack jack, uh, life Pack guys over there, and they gifted me this jacket, which I wear for to this day. Wow. It's also... Nice and warm, and yeah, it's a little cold in here. Yeah, it's it's all right. Yeah, I tried to. Philly, I tried Philly's to mim- warmer than Bo- uh, Philly's warmer than Rhode Island, Boston. So I try fine. to mimic the hospital settings in these in this room to you know make these attending physicians feel comfortable, <laughs> but I don't know if it's similar the temperature wise. <laughs> nah, it's fine. It's There's just never a good temperature in no. any hospitals. It's no. either too hot or too cold. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. In regards to difficulty, like in like hours wor- working per week in residency training, how was uh, the emergency medicine residency? Um. Just in terms of, I mean, I can only speak like from the perspective. I, yeah. I mean, I thought we, I mean, Rhode Island Hospital is a very, very busy academics uh, receiving center. There's only a few hospitals in Rhode Island. So we had a very large capture rate. Um, we were What's busy. What's capture rate? So basically, like, you know, if there's only one hospital within, say, like a hundred mile radius, yeah. then everything within that hundred mile radius comes to you. I see. Okay. But if you are, say, one of the 20 hospitals in New York City, mm-hmm. You know, the volume might be high overall, but mm-hmm. that volume gets distributed to all the hospitals. I see. So Rhode Island Hospital had a very, you know, high level of critically ill patients. In fact, in our emergency department, there was a section of the emergency department that was dedicated to critically ill patients um, that were also dealing with trauma patients. So there was, it was like a high acuity, a high volume place. So I learned a lot and our shifts were... They're reasonable, I think, for the future EM bound listeners to this uh, interview. I think eight hours is a very healthy amount. And if you are very, very stoic and have much more stamina than I do, you can try 12s. But as I get older, 12 hour shifts have become much more challenging to me. Um, than they would have been a few years ago. And in residency, do you do do you get to pick eight hours or twelve hours, or you do do you do? Ours were primary, uh, predominantly eight. Eight, okay. And yeah. you do how many eights do you do a week? Oh, I have no idea. You it's don't know. Idea. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't. It was. Um, 
I felt it was appropriate. I never yeah. felt burnt out in, Got it. in residency. Okay, great. So I think as a learner in residency, you really want to, like, I think one of the, the key things to, to recognize in a program is the more patients you see, the more experiences you'll learn, you'll get in a crew and the better doctor you'll become. Yeah, okay. I think that's really important. And if, if, if say, you're a fourth-year medical student and mm -hmm. you're applying to programs and stuff like that, how should you th think about uh, ranking your emergency medicine programs? And how should you think about picking the ones that you kind of want to attend above others? That is a very tricky question because it. it's very personalized. I and okay. I will say, um, I would defer that to the student's mentor. Got it. Um, but... There, there are some trends. Some students really say, I like the, the West Coast, I mm -hmm. like the East Coast, I like to stay close to family. Mm -hmm. Some students may have a preference to a three-year program versus a four-year program, I see. of which I can only say that I trained at a four-year program, so I'm biased, uh -huh. but I, you know, I think either it's three or four, the graduates are more than capable of becoming excellent, or they're, they're graduates. They're yeah. capable of handling emergency medicine. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a personal preference on which one will give you a more... A unique like mm -hmm. residency experience, um, but I think you know one of the most challenging element is that in a post-COVID pandemic era, um, personal like in-person interviews are are out of the picture, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think there's so much to learn and experience when you go into the facilities, when you meet the people, when you visit the cities. Now, of course, as someone who is on the the court committee, I also recognize that. Asking everyone to fly to a new city, especially during interview season, it's expensive and it's time consuming. And there are pros and cons after everything is moved to the virtual element. Um, as an old school person, I kind of miss the, the in-person visits. Um, but I think going back to the, the question is what recommendations I would have is get to really sp spend some time with the residents as much as possible because... I think you'll read a lot of things on paper, but it's really talking to the students, asking them about pointing questions that I think really distinguishes which program Got comes it. on top or bottom. Got it. So definitely reach out to your mentor when you're figuring out. Definitely reach out to your mentor because I think this is such a, a personal yeah. like yeah. decision. Um, and I, as far as I know, there's no list that decides which one is the top emergency medicine program. There, there might be some list floating out there as far as I know, and to the within my circle of emergency medicine like leaders in, in the country, I, I think we do not put as much credence to that list as I see. possible. Got it. Yeah. I see. We I do not have access to a secret list of <laughs> the, the top tier top residency programs in emergency medicine. He's I just do not have that, that here. He actually has it, and he's not <laughs> giving it to me. No. <laughs> now I don't think, as far as I know. To my knowledge, yeah. I do not have that access. Okay, got it, got it. But now you are an attending. Yes. What is that like? It's a, uh, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of work. More work than residency. I would say, if you do hours by hours, yeah. I think residents definitely put in a lot of hours. Mm -hmm. I think, as you mentioned in the beginning of this sh interview, that attendings usually work between you said. 40s it was like 46. 50. Yeah, 46 compared to the average uh, MD regular attendings or other all other specialties averaged is 51. Mm -hmm. And then emergency medicine attendings is 46. So I would say we probably work a little bit fewer hours than residents. Yeah. But I will say that being an emergency attending is a stressful work because okay. you're taking care of all the patients in your zone and all the patients have different backgrounds, different levels of acuities, different things that can happen acutely during your shift, right? It's a constant war zone, and you just don't know when someone who came in with a benign chief complaint accidentally or ended up having something more catastrophic, and all your attention is now sucked into that area while your other patients go unnoticed. So I think the level of responsibility and the level of stress is increased significantly as an attending. But you're trained to do that. Right? Like the whole purpose of a residency is to train you to know how to manage the chaos in and, and, and a way that incorporates all the players within the department to work in synchrony to best expedite patient care. So you're, you're trained to do it, but it doesn't make it any easier. Yeah, yeah. What, so what is like a day-to-day -day life for you? 
Like, so say, I know the weeks could differ. Um, mm-hmm. So let's start with a week. So what would an average week, like, would you, do you have a couple days where you're in the emergency room? I know you're a teacher as well. Do you spend a couple of days teaching? How does, how does it work for you right now? So I will say that I'm probably not your traditional emergency medicine physician and that yeah. I try to do everything and that can be a little bit tiring. So on a day-to-day, I will say that a lot of my time is devoted to clerkship. A lot of my time is devoted to teaching. I teach about maybe five to six classes. Wow. Um, a lot of my time is devoted to mentoring. And a lot of my time is devoted to research. And some of the time, which should be more of the time, should be devoted to my family. And, and I will say that work-life balance is something that I am struggling with. But from an academic clinical perspective, at least that part is easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but my day-to-day is usually, I don't know, like 8 a.m. is when I teach, start my first class, followed by meetings in the mid-early afternoon, followed by clinical shifts in the evening, afternoon time, and rinse and repeat. So I, I'm usually. I mean, I can show you what my schedule is here, but so it's so is it like you you teach from busy. eight and then you yes let's break it if you don't mind yeah yeah, be yeah, interesting. yeah. you just just run me through a day or a, or, an, or a particular an average the most average day you can find the most average day. So let's see what happened on ah. So let's just say last today is what's today. Today's the twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. So let's just say on average. Day is um, like last Wednesday. So last Wednesday, I taught from 8 to 12. I had a meeting from 12 to 1. I had a teaching session from 1 to 2.30. And then I think I had uh, five meetings after that. Five meetings after that? Yeah, I think my meetings went up to 11 o'clock at night time. Oh my goodness. This is a lot, and this is these these aren't this isn't time in the emergency room. This is these are just meeting meetings, teaching teaching. Wow, teaching teaching meeting meeting. Wow. Um, my I have a decent amount of academic buy down. So yeah. for most physicians, you either work clinically, yeah. you do research, or you do admin, and that's kind of so teaching work, so work, teach admin, and research. I think yeah. those are like the four ways in which you can, you know, prove your worth mm-hmm. to the hospital. I see. Um, you obviously can't do all of them all the time. Yeah. So whatever that you can do in one of the sectors will kind of slowly eat away your clinical time. So mm-hmm. I do not spend as much clinical time as the traditional emergency physician. Mm-hmm. But then that extra time is spent to my other interests. And I kind of just want to bring this into the burnout, which I'm sure in- inevitably we'll talk about. But I believe there's been some literature in the past that says one of the solutions to burnout is to diversify your interests and Mm -hmm. do something that you love in addition to emergency Mm -hmm. medicine. So I love teaching. I love mentorship. I think that's something that I value so much as a resident. I had tremendous and helpful mentors that shaped who I am as a person, not just as a physician. And I I love doing that for students in kind. So I, I put my extra hours of my day to help mentor students become even a stronger version that they were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with my uh, position in the med at SI track, I personally mentor some of the students who, you know, even as a a first year or second year medical student, they are already applying for grants, presenting at conferences. um, And I love doing that. I think I, I love working with the medical students. It's funny because they always think themselves as on the lower totem pole of the hospital chain, I, I think they're just untapped resource. They have everyone is so talented. They all have so many skill sets. Um, look at you. You're, you, you, you. You do these uh, <laughs> interview sessions. You have your like YouTube channel. Yeah. That it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, but like they all have such amazing talents that, and unfortunately, all we see as attendings is just their medical capabilities. But I see them for so much more, and I love giving them opportunities, finding them mentors who hopefully will have something more than I can offer them so they can be the best that they could ever be. And they have more options to choose. So I love that. And when I do things that I love outside of my work, it gives me it gives me life. You know, like 
work can be hard. Actually, work is not too bad. Work is fine. I love work. <laughs> um, but whatever stressors I have from work, I get to mentor. You know, I get to mentor. I get to teach these students. I get to be uh, someone that can push them into what it is that they want to pursue, right? Um, and I and I love that. And that does take time from my day, but it's something that gives me joy, which decreases my burnout. Did you have like a experience with a specific mentor or something like that that's made you so passionate about this? Or was it actually like when you started to mentor students and be with students, you're like, wow, this is almost like the click you had when you were in the emergency room for that third year. Was it like, okay, this is what I want to do more of with students teaching students? Or, Go ahead. Yeah, you know, so I was going to say, I've, I've been a terrible mentor slash coach for the last like four out of the five years because I didn't know what it meant to be a good mentor. And, okay. I, and it took some, you know, figuring out the right things and the wrong things that I've done to say like, okay, I, I shouldn't have the same expectation I have for myself for all my mentees. And that took some time to, to get through it. But I also believe that you should never just have one mentor. There should never be one person that is in charge of changing who you are or making you better. You might have a mentor for public speaking. You might have a mentor of how to be a better husband if you're spending a lot of time at work. Like someone that you see like, oh, how is it that you balance six kids and work and a happy lifestyle? Please teach me your ways, right? Um, I'm a big fan of having multiple mentors in all elements of life. And, and I got that because I had multiple mentors in all elements of life, and I learned a little bit from each and every one, just like emergency medicine. I learned <laughs> a little bit from all the consultants that I talk about, and then I, I become just a little smarter day after day. How should students or people, I guess, find their mentors? Because I think this is a key question. I think at Jefferson, we have an amazing connection with teachers and professors and helpers. It's one of the reasons I love it so much. It's one of the reasons I'm only talking to Jefferson people because you guys are just so amazing and you're there for us. And you actually take the steps to reach out to us, which I think is different than maybe some other places. So how maybe other students or maybe people not even, you know, and all along the same track of EM, how should they find mentors? You need to find yourself a good gateway mentor. Got it. A gateway mentor. mentor. You need a gateway mentor ah. because you need a mentor that says, you know, a, a mentor that is able to look within themselves and say, you need something that I cannot provide, but let me t reach out to someone else, like a word of mouth and say, hey, look, Zach needs someone that's really good at IT and social media. Mm -hmm. And I use an encyclopedia on on paper. So I don't think I'm the right person. <laughs> do you actually use an encyclopedia? I do have an encyclopedia. <laughs> but the point is, is that I'm going to reach out to someone else I know who might just be a little bit more knowledgeable about this. And he or she may know someone else. So mm -hmm. it's the, you know, it's both advocating for yourself and knowing someone who's willing to advocate for you. I think, you know, networking is key. I'm actually really terrible at networking. Despite my, I, I don't like public speaking. Yeah. As, as crazy as it sounds, I, I, I end up doing a lot of it. Uh -huh. But you know, I find that networking is really the best way. And finding a mentor that is going to go out of their way and recognizing what they're good at and what they're not good at is the key to like finding multiple mentors. And you said the first four years of your five years of mentorship, you were doing it wrong. Yeah. Why were you doing it wrong? Ah, uh, you know, I. If you think of a pendulum in terms of the styles of mentorship, mm -hmm. I went in the very beginning elements. I, you know, I'm an immigrant. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in China. I came over here, and, and I think my parents had the successful American dream. I think I continued that successful American dream, and I have a high expectation as an immigrant of like what it takes to succeed. So. I do a lot of stuff within work. I do a lot of stuff outside of work. And I initially, as a mentor, put all of that expectation to my mentees, which requires a lot of sacrifice that I think not many of my mentees who did not share my future goals um, really appreciated. And I think I, I probably burned a few bridges as a result. Like I was a bad mentor. Um, and then the pendulum swung to the laissez-faire, like what if I just tell you one or two things and you figure it out? And then I realized that with that kind of um, hand-free mentorship, there was no guidance and nothing really happened as a result. Like I didn't think I provided them with good direction. They didn't know what they wanted to do. And after like a year or two, we just ended up being friends. But that's not what a mentor does. Like we can be friends without being mentors. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I'm now switching more towards the middle spot where, you know, I have to accept what elements I can bring as a mentor. And now I'm very transparent of this is who I am as a mentor. These are my expectations. If you would like me to be your mentor, these are my expectations for you. But I don't think that you need to have these. So you need to tell me what it is that you want. And I want to meet your expectations. And anything that happens beyond that, you have to give me permission. Because as adult learners, they're not going to do something that they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Right? So if there's no, um, there's no reward at the end of the stick, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, they're not going to do it. And I don't want to, I don't want to personally, personally feel um, disappointed if they didn't do what I asked them to do, realizing that we are just adults with different sets of expectations mm -hmm. and goals. So that's why I would say for the last four out of my five years in attending, um, I just wasn't a good mm -hmm. mentor. And I think I'm finally getting a little bit better. That's interesting. That's really interesting. I always think, because I'm always coming at it from the other side, right? I'm not mentoring anyone. Well, I mean, maybe I speak to the occasional people that are interested in medical school, but I'm always looking up to see, okay, what's a good mentor? What's a bad mentor? And what should I look for? So that's so that's really interesting. I do want to talk about burnout, because I think we mentioned it a couple times now. Mm -hmm. You have an interesting, not what I would think is the classical uh clinician attending uh, work schedule, right? Mm -hmm. It's different. And you you attribute that to kind of helping your your burnout and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you think that people can do that medical students, residents, or doctors should think about when trying to kind of fight off burnout? Because it's nearly, I mean, what the, the general is like 46, it's like 46%, right? Among all averaged across all physicians, which is nearly half. It's, it's crazy. <sighs> It's, it's hard. I, I, I don't know. I think uh -huh. one of the, I think in emergency medicine, it can be very frustrating when you want to do something and whether it's due to electronic health records, whether it's because of boarding or insert whichever complaints that some of the physician mm -hmm. may have that you're just not able to provide the optimal care and then when you have burnout, that trickles down to yourself, your patients, your family. Um, one of the things that helps me with burnout from a clinical perspective is that I remember, I always try to remember why I went into emergency medicine, which is, you know, I love people. You know, I like to think the good things of people and not the bad elements. Because sometimes when, when you feel particularly tired and salty, you might start thinking not the best of those people. And that can take you to a very, very dark hole, especially if you are the, if you're the champion of healthcare, if you're swore a duty to protect all patients and you start feeling salty about your patients, then you can't, you know, you're biased against them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I do is I always, and, and every person I've ever worked in the ER knows that I just, I love my patients, which is important. I don't have to necessarily like all of them, but I love all of them and I have to take care of all of them and I get to take care of all of them. Uh, and I think that prevents me from any burnout that would result in like poor patient care because it's like, listen, this is just who I am. My identity is I'm a doctor who loves his patients. And I think it's a, a smart distinction as well, just even the wordage. And you were saying this earlier when you were talking about mentoring students. I get to be with the patients. You know, I get to teach these students as opposed to I have to, or this is my job, or this is what I need to do. It's an interesting, it's a small distinction, but I think it's a key. It's a major key. And this is one of the things, you know, when I was studying from, for, I was like, I'm looking at these books for like three, six hours. Like, this is insane. I think back to uh, when I was applying to med school and I was like, God, I want to be here so badly. And now I'm there and now I'm thinking, oh, I have to do this. So I get, I think is a really really interesting distinction to make. I mean, I have to say, I'm, I know it's going to sound really cheesy as okay. this interview is going to go on, but I really think that we are honored and privileged to be in a position that we are. Like, number one, physicians are regarded publicly as before COVID, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess. Um, you know, we're, we're like, we're a noble field, right? Like, we, we really try to uphold health and, and all that it is involved in. And, you know, and what case in a social world can you go into a room and have someone undress completely and share all of the most intimate health personal psychiatric history to you without a blink of an eye i mean that is a it is a privilege to be involved with the most intimate elements of a patient of a person's life 
because that's kind of our job. Like our job is to take out information because we spend hours and days and months and years in the library looking at videos, learning about the anatomy. It's like we are finally at a position to put that to good use. And I think we're privileged to get a glimpse into people's lives that are confidential, that they don't even tell their loved ones, right? I think if you think of it from that perspective, we're, we have a special power. Our power is to get to know people. And I think as physicians, we tend to forget about that. We, we tend to only see people based on their lab results, based on their x-rays. And, and we tend to forget that they're here because they're emotionally in duress. They, they need someone, they need a they need a, a hand to hold them. They need some, a shoulder to cry on. Like We have that opportunity and we got to cut the line that most people will have to spend years to get to know them that we just would, got there immediately and say, my job is to take care of you. Mm. How can I help you? And I think that's, I don't know, that feels like romantic to me is that this is, that's why, you know, I've rarely, there's few times I feel burnt out, but those are situational. But I, I just don't feel burnt out as a, an emergency physician or a physician in general. It's like, this is, like, this is pretty awesome. Was there ever like a super or a particularly memorable patient encounter that you've had where you felt kind of this connection with a person or something like that? Um, I will say that in emergency, the emergency physicians tend to be a, like a thankless field. Mm. Um, and this might ruffle like a few feathers. So like I, I this is like my, my end of one feeling. Yeah. So it's yeah. objective. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. These are not objective feelings or, or statements. I feel that we're a little underloved by a lot of patients and colleagues because mm. as colleagues, we give work to a lot of people. Like we, we consult, we admit. Um, as you know, as doctors, we're like we're not seeing people when they're the happiest. We're not the the life saving cardiologist. People tend to forget about us, or they tend to be angry at us when we don't find the problem to their a solution to their problem. Um, and I will say one of the things that attributes to a lot of burnout from my colleagues and and all the elements of the the workforce is that there's just not a lot of positive feedback. There's not a lot of positive reinforcements. And and I try to change that. So whenever the t um, like someone hands me an EKG, as attendings, we get a lot of EKGs. We get every EKG from every patient that comes in. And instead of viewing it with like Ugh, another thing I have to read and review, I take the time and I thank the person. Say thank you for taking the time and getting this really well done EKG, and for doing your job. I think you did an excellent job. And mm -hmm. I think it's not often that we get thanked. Mm -hmm. You know, it's. You know, it's a hard work, but a little thing goes a long way. And I try to thank people as much as possible yeah. when I'm in, in the department. And um, and the reason why I bring this up is that I had a patient recently send me a letter to my like my work address. And I will say that when I first saw the letter in my mailbox, I thought it was going to be like a, a lawsuit suit. letter. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh dear God, what? <laughs> I thought the HR was supposed to tell me these things and aren't they supposed to read my letters before I opened it? Um, but it was from a patient, I'll just say an undisclosed amount of time, um, a patient who wrote about their care when they were in the emergency department. And they thanked me because I usually try to call a patient um, I try to like once after every shift, I choose one patient that I think, you know what, I'll call this person and see how they're doing. And I called this patient up because one of the, uh, one of their imaging was slightly updated. And this, I called this patient specifically because I said, look, even though the, the read might be a little bit different, I think this is a read that you should talk to your doctor about, maybe get an additional consultation and look this look into it because I think this could be what brought you to me in the first place. Um, and that patient wrote me back and said, you know, as that person was also in the healthcare industry, but I didn't know that until later on. It's like, you know, as someone who's in the healthcare industry, I can see that my initial chief complaint could have been glossed over, but you spent the time sat down next to me, you brought a pillow to my spouse who was sitting next to me and they were falling asleep. 
you called me about this read that I initially was just going to blow it off. Maybe I would have read it, but that phone call changed the entire course. And now I've had this major operation that I would have never found. And it has completely changed my life. Thank you so much for taking me seriously. And I was moved to tears. I, I don't get very many thank you letters. I, I can count with one hand the number of thank you letters that I've gotten. Um, less than five. <laughs> less than five. One hand. Um, probably more or less, plus or minus two. But it is, it's rare. you know. With, with, and, and it's because in emergency medicine, you're tasked with seeking out emergencies. right? And I have learned, even just through my short career, that diseases don't follow the general pattern. They're very tricky. And it can be missed. Even the most thorough workups can miss the most devastating diagnosis. And you never know when it's just going to be your luck that you're going to be faced with that situation. And all we hear about in within our own circles is that patient that we miss a diagnosis. Um, in fact, one of the, the worst thing you can hear as a physician is the phrase, do you remember that patient? I think there is probably no scarier words to say to a doctor than, do you remember that guy that you saw? Because nothing good happens after that. It's like, oh my God, what disease did I miss? What horrible thing happened? And it's that constant dread, it's that constant fear of, did I not do all the, like as much as I could, like every single day. So to receive something that was so positive and unprovoked really made me feel special. It's like, I guess, I guess I'm a good doctor. You know, mm -hmm. I, I guess I found something and it's, and it was just like that small little thing. I'm sure they would have found it at, at some point, but it was that extra effort that I think really made a difference in, in that patient's perspective. Um, yeah. I think it's just the little things in life yeah. that, that prevents burnout. That's amazing. Did, did that have any significant impacts on the way you practice medicine or the way you teach as it, at, at anything or, or, or just kind of thanking more people like you're doing with the EKGs and stuff like that? You know, I think it really reinforced some of the, one of the teaching elements I, t I have for any learners is someone smarter than I am has once told me, it's not what you do to a patient that matters, but it's what you can do for a patient. Um, and just like as you mentioned, it's just a small change of words, but what you do to a patient could include IVs, pain medicine, antibiotics, pressors, chest tubes, you know, electrocution, like whatever. It can be a lot of things you can do to a patient to make them better. But what you can do for a patient is bring a chair to their spouse who's been standing for 12 hours while waiting for a bed. What you can do for a patient is listen that their quality of life has really decreased and they don't want an extensive workup, but they just want something to make them feel better. What you can do for a patient is realizing that their phone has died and that all they really want is to charge their phone so they can tell their parents that they're in the hospital. And, and I think it's, it's that element that makes me every day try to figure out how can I be a better version of myself than yesterday. And I think that internal drive prevents burnout. Because I think it, there's, you know, I think burnout happens when you do the same thing day after day after day after day, and that just wears upon. It's like, well, what am I doing different today? I think with that, that element of what can I do to make a patient stay more comfortable, to make them feel heard. I think that's that's the art of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, and I and I think that keeps me, you know, it keeps me happy to come to work. No, oh, that's that's amazing. And I was reading this thing on Medscape, and I might have got the numbers a little bit off, but the Medscape question report, and it seemed in 2019, or before COVID, the burnout in emergency doctors was, I think, 47, right around average. Mm -hmm. And then it jumped 13% kind of the year later, kind of, I guess this was mid, the mid beginning of COVID. I guess we're eight months into COVID at that point. What was it like practicing emergency medicine during COVID? I guess it's still going on, but I mean, during the, the initial beginnings, the first year of COVID. I'll, I'll try to stay as like apolitical as possible yeah, okay. with these answers. Um, you can do whatever you want. You can that's say whatever true. You want. That's true. Um, I will say that from politics, cultures, racism aside, yeah. being a physician during COVID was pretty rough. Um, I think it's it's a new disease. We don't know what's going on. Everyone got to stay home. And except, you. except for me, yeah, and not a newborn. Wow. So I was like, I don't know. Am I bringing something that's going to kill my daughter every day? I don't know. Got to go to work. 
and it's it's painful because there was so much uncertainty and you know one of the scariest thing and this is not to burn out just like you asked what's it like to be a doctor mm-hmm. I, I think at some point we we were looking at what's the worst case scenario what happens when there aren't enough ventilators how do you say no to a patient that's dying and say i'm sorry we don't have the resources to save you we have to choose someone else um you know uh fortunately in the beginning parts in the very beginning of covid except for new york um people just didn't want to come to the hospital and because they were scared and what ended up happening is that the people who had bad unchecked chronic diseases just got worse and just showed up and died wow so that that was the other half. Either people came in with really sick COVID, or mm-hmm. people were so scared of the hospital that they showed up with decompensated sepsis mm-hmm. or cardiac arrest because they just said, you know, I'm having this chest pain, but you know, I don't want to go to the hospital because I don't want to risk COVID. So yeah. that heart attack just got yeah. worse. So medically, that was challenging, and at some point, the overcrowding. And the inability to discharge patients from upstairs became so rampant that, you know, overcrowding is an emergency. And just being unable to provide care because there's not any rooms available to see a patient was, it was depressing. I would say like, that's probably when I felt mm-hmm. a little bit burnt out. I see. Because I, you see the waiting room, you know what their chief complaint is, you see their vital signs, and you look at your own ER and you say, there's not a single open room that I can that I can take them to. And we did a lot of creative things. A lot of them, and, and I have to thank the the operations team within Jefferson. They did a lot of amazing work to, to expedite patient care, to create rooms where rooms didn't exist. A lot of emergency protocols had to be placed. But even then, it's like putting a bandage on a, on a big open cut. I mean, it, it's only going to hold out for so long. And that's probably the most challenging element because as you can probably surmise, I, I want to take care of patients. I want to see them get better and to be physically shackled and not be able to see them is, it's just hard. You know, it's like you, you watch their vital signs get worse and you just say like, well, I, I want to do something for you, mm-hmm. but what can I do? Like, yeah. there's not enough equipment. There's not enough staffing. And with the staffing call outs, it was also challenging because people get sick yeah. right, right, with COVID. It's, yeah. it's not even that people didn't want to come to work. Yeah. They just Don't inevitably give yeah. got sick and then we're, we're short on staff. So it's short on staff, too many patients, not enough place to see them. And the patients get upset because we're trying to get creative with seeing patients. And now privacy becomes an issue when people are in the hallways just to be seen. And it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to be a teacher. It's hard to be a learner. Um, and I think that was very stressful then and still ongoing now. Still going. Yeah. But board, I mean, I think there's recent uh, news right now that I think the, the pediatric hospitals in Philadelphia are being overwhelmed with diseases like flu and RSV. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. And and we're also we're 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 busy. I think a lot of our neighbor hospitals are busy as well. And we're, we're trying to do our best. And every hospital, their administrators have their operations team is trying to to make the system leaner, better, stronger. But it's hard. Yeah. What is making a system leaner? Is that is that um kind of getting people through the check-in process quickly and then the discharge process more quickly, assuming they're healthy, of course, uh, but the the time from discharge to leaving the room to the rooms ready for another patient kind of thing, is that what leaning up a system is? Or Yeah, so I mean, I will just say, because I'm not on the operations yeah. team, I don't want to say anything that's incorrect, yeah. but just from a global sense, right? So reduce the time for a physician to physically lay hands and eyes and do an exam for a patient. Um, allowing for more flexible boarding situations as an inpatient floor. So creating rooms. Um, now, of course, this is under the, the concept of emergency. We wouldn't mm-hmm. do this on normal circumstance, but we have to. Uh, reducing um, maybe elective imaging 
for example, instead of coming to the ER for a non-emergent x-ray or a CAT scan, uh, maybe try to arrange a more fluid outpatient process. Um, and sometimes it might just be, look, this could, you could be admitted, but in the setting of no hospital space, encourage the outpatient providers to create a more robust follow-up process with these patients. So instead of coming into the hospital, they can get an expedited outpatient workup and follow-up. So the, the list goes on and on. And I, and I think we have, we're doing our best now that it's so many years after COVID to try to make the system even more lean, but mm. it's a, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And we try things that worked. We try things that didn't work. And every day we just have to go back and as emergency room doctors, I just say, just keep on trying. Yeah. 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 And I, and I do apologize. I know that we're not supposed to say ER doctors. Technically it's always oh, emergency. You're not meant to say it's that. not. It's like one of those like, Slap on the wrist situation. It's either EM doctors. So it's emergency medicine doctors, so Got EM it. doctors, or emergency department. Got it. Technically, ER is just an emergency room, which uh-huh. is one room. Oh. So technically, it's like I one see. of those like small uh, little nuances, I like will, spelling ophthalmology to, yeah, correctly. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, it's just that still, one I'll little H that's in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so anyway. Is, an OB, is OBGYN a hyphen or a dash? A dash. You, who knows? Or is it a slat? You, you know what I mean? A, 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 one of those. What is that called? A slash. I, I don't know. Hyphen? No. Hyphen? No, the slash. The slash thing. Yeah, it's just called a slash. The slash thing. So given these happy stories, mm-hmm. say I was to give you $100 million today, tax-free in your account, never have to do anything. You could do whatever you want with it. Would you? No. Conti- I would still keep on working. Still keep on working. Yeah. Yeah. I'm one of those people that will, despite my wife's disagreement, I'll probably work until like I evaporate into a puff yeah. of smoke. Yeah, yeah. Would you change anything at all? Would you do more? Would you put more time in different things, or would you keep working exactly the same way? Probably work less hard. Okay. Yeah, I mean, what does that mean? Less hard. Just say say no to things. Got it. Got it. <laughs> As a young physician yeah. in training, I think you should be very open to new opportunities, mm-hmm. new research options, and ways to broaden your your training. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I've reached a point where I really need to start saying no to things because just because I can doesn't mean I should. Mm-hmm. And I really would like to prioritize spending more time with my family. Um, you know, my, my mother-in-law, who I love very much, she is a physician, a mother, a grandmother, and she's also a researcher and scholar. Wow. And she had told me that you know, and as in a life of a life of a physician, there's three real important things if you want to consider. You can be a good doctor, you can be a good teacher or researcher, one of the two, and you can be a good parent. Of those three, you can only really do two of those really well, mm-hmm. and you you kind of have to be a good doctor. So it's just a matter of what's the one that you want to lose, and I think that. You know, why I do love research, I do love medicine. I think that if I had that extra money just laying around, I like to spend it some more with my family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. That's probably what I would do. Yeah. That, that makes sense to me. Yeah. But I would still work. Yeah. I would still, still work. work. Yeah. You wouldn't go live on an island with your family or, uh, no. No, I would, I would still give up your mentorship. I didn't know. No, the mentorship. I, I like the mentorship. Yeah. In fact, I have a scheduled meeting every night at 10 to, like, it's my open office hours. Wow. So from 10 to midnight, I stay, I, I go on my, my Zoom, and uh-huh. it's a whoever needs to show up. And it's like my virtual library. Yeah. So if you have stuff you want to do, work that you want to have, you want to just chat and talk, my Zoom session is available to Can any. Can put that link in the video down there? <laughs> <laughs> It's got a lot of numbers and letters and consonants <laughs> and a few dashes and slashes. Uh, but I, I do it because I think it's, an, it's you know, I just want to show that everyone that I've ever taught and mentored that if you want an opportunity to to get more work done, I'm there. That's nice. That's yeah. really, When do you go to bed? That's a good question. How many hours of sleep do you get? I should get more. I think on average I get about four. Four? To five, which is just a little less than the number of coffees I have on a regular day. You should have about like 
four to six. Wow. On a regular day. What's a non-regular day tip? A non-regular day is, is if I need to do so. My work overnights, I usually will work during the day, uh-huh. take like a quick power nap, yeah, and then wake up to do my evening shifts or overnight shifts. Yeah, so that's like a twenty-two hour day. Wow. Usually in those days, I double my coffee intake, so it's so about like eight to twelve. Eight to twelve cups. It's okay. I can fall asleep at a moment's notice, unfortunately. Well, that makes sense. I yeah. mean, if you're sleeping four to five hours every, yeah. every night, that's… It's, uh, yeah, it's not ideal. Yeah. It's not ideal. Do which is say, why with more money, I would like to get more sleep. How, do you have one kid? Two kids? I have one daughter. One daughter. She's three. Uh-huh. Um, and then I have a son that should join us in late November. Oh, congratulations. When Thank this? You. That's congratulations. Your son will hopefully be alive and well by the time this goes live. Abs- absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. That's fantastic. Um, I was just thinking, you know, young kids, maybe that could be contributing to the uh, the sleep. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I mean, I think there's there's many more joys in life yeah. with, with her around. Yeah. Um, but I will say with like another new family, we, we just bought a new, our first house. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's like adulthood. Wow. Back to emergency medicine. Yes. I, I want to, because I'm, you know, I always do these things and I want to learn how to live the best life from people, but that's a whole nother thing. We're talking yeah. about emergency medicine. So, as an EM, EM doc, EM mm-hmm. doc, mm-hmm. what is the best thing about being an EM doc? The best thing is, the best and the worst thing is that you get to leave work behind by the time mm-hmm. you leave. And I say it's the best because when your shift is over, you're done. You you leave your patient care to your colleague whom you trust and can rely on and say that I trust you to carry on the work mm-hmm. that I had initially started. The worst thing about that is you really, if you don't take the extra effort, you really won't know what happened to your patient. Mm-hmm. You don't know if your actions are correct or incorrect. Your, your time has stopped with that patient. Um, now, with the advent of the electronic medical records, you can go back and say, hey, what did happen to this patient that I was worried about? Did something else come up? Did this person get a different diagnosis than I had anticipated? But that takes extra effort. Um, so I say the best thing about emergency medicine, and that's why a lot of us, for those who are interested, we all have a lot of hobbies. Like, you know, when I was a residency, there was this one colleague who would show up right after he just scuba dived you know, three hours in the coast and come in with a wetsuit and like, I'm ready. It looks scuba sc- dive? Yeah, or not scuba like or not not scuba dive. Um what did he do? He uh he would um surf. Sorry, surf. he surfed. Okay. Still. He would like yeah, he would surf like miles and miles away. Yeah. And then he would come in with a wetsuit, change in the office and go straight to work. Um people have, you know, come into work in like a snowmobile. People have a lot of hobbies that they do inside and outside of work. And it's because of our shift work that we give ourselves the opportunities to pursue other things aside from medicines that we like. And I think that's a really great benefit of emergency medicine. And the worst thing is that we have no control over our lives. I see. So, so the... You know, we don't know what our day to day is. You know, mm. I, I don't know my schedule past December. Mm. You know, I I trust that our scheduler can put our important life events on hold for us. But you know, if if you need, if you are someone who enjoys a scheduled like a plan from morning until dusk, this is not the best profession. Mm. And if you cannot convert from days to nights and nights to days, this is not the best profession. Mm. And if you're just a little, and the grind is rough, and if you do not have the stamina to continue with the days and the grinds of just running in the emergency department, this can be a rough field. Um, You know, one of my students recently asked me, like, how come there's no ER doctor or emergency doctor that's older than the age of 60? I was like, that's not true. I know a few that are working very hard. They're very smart. But those are rare. You know, it's, and it's because, you know, our work is hard. Our cortisol levels are high when we're in the emergency department. Um, And it's just, it's a, it's a tough field. 
Is there anything you wish someone told you before going into emergency medicine? Told you what it would be like or pay attention to this or this is what's going to happen when you're an EM doc? Or any surprises when you were actually practicing? I'm surprised to see like burnout in action. Yeah. I will say. As someone who I think, I'm someone that's very naive. I like to think the best of people and I don't think I'm you know, burnt out from, I'm always very taken back when I hear our close friends and families who are in emergency medicine, like verbally express how burnt out they are by mm. the process. Um, it makes me wonder if I've just been too blinded by how much I love emergency medicine mm. and how much I care about it. Uh, but that's always the thing that I find like, huh, I, I wonder why I'm not seeing the same thing that you are. Mm-hmm. And I keep on wondering if it's because I'm just not working as much as they are. Yeah. And you see immediate colleagues with burnout and stuff like that? I would say over the past few years, um, I've seen close friends who have expressed burnout. Yeah. Yeah. Not to patient harm. Yeah, no, no, no. Of course, yeah. Just like they've expressed that they are burnt out. Wow. Did you see any, subjectively, anecdotally, did you see uh, it increase after COVID or during COVID? The beginning, I guess, first year or year and a half? Or not really? Probably after COVID, more. yeah, yeah, yeah. COVID is just hard for everyone. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, <laughs> it's it was really hard for a lot of people, yeah. and it's still hard for a lot of people. Uh-huh. So I think that compounded to the stressors it just didn't make it easier. Yeah, yeah. Is there a, like a a myth that most people think about EM docs, or the most common myth when you say this is something an EM doc, doc does or something about an EM doc. Is there anything that jumps into your mind? Not necessarily from like med students or residents or colleague doctors, maybe just from people when they think about what an EM doc does or what they're like. Is there a myth that pumps into your head? A lot of people think we're surgeons. Okay. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, You do I, procedures, We right? do procedures. Yeah. But if I were to do a surgery, that would be called attempted murder. If I, if I were to cut <laughs> someone open... Like that's that's not good. Like you don't want me to open someone's belly up. That's that's never a good sign. Um, I don't know why they think we're sur- I mean, we do life saving procedures. Yeah. Um, but I don't really fancy myself as a surgeon. Yeah, that's but interesting. Aside from that, I think you know emergency. I think either from the show ER or mm-hmm. from shows like Scrubs. Um, I don't think there's many like assumptions about emergency physicians. Now I do. Love one of the uh, the social media physician is uh, Dr. Glockenflocken. Yep, he yeah, yeah. is. I was going to bring him up, but I did because the bike helmet. You've talked me about the uh, the um the, the the surfer guy, and I was like, I was thinking of the bike helmet. The guy. bike helmet, the yeah. bike helmet with the Diet Coke. Yeah, yeah, yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. I definitely, uh, I will say that his skits are outrageously accurate, and they're hilarious. Um, I love them. I have no financial affiliation with Dr. Glockenflocken. Uh, and I'm married an ophthalmologist, so I okay. really, I really do love the eyeball. So you have some uh, emotional affiliation. Right? I have emotional affiliations yeah. with ophthalmology, and yeah, I mean his stuff, his stuff is great. Do people wear bike helmets when they walk? Are all EM docs given a bike helmet in their first hospital tour? Um, no, not really. really? No, you, would, okay. you would think that. I'd think that. Yeah, that was my myth. That I thought. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of us do like to. Exp- we're a high risk population. Mm-hmm. Um, I think so. This is just, of course, putting ourselves as a, a whole collective group. Mm-hmm. We like to explore more dangerous hobbies. Um, some of that could just be riding a bike nowadays. Um, I bought myself one of those electric scooters, which is why I have the, I saw that the electric the bike. Yep. Mm-hmm. Those things, PSA, are very dangerous. They are outrageously dangerous. And the for the listeners out there who have a scooter, I really do like it. It has cut my commute. But the city of Philadelphia with the railroad tracks, please do not try to cross a railroad track. I've seen too many open ankle fractures as a result of that. Oh um, and those things are fast. They're like 15 miles per hour. Yeah. And they you will fall. And when you fall sometimes too, your your hands are this way. So the scary thing is that you can fall forward right on your head. Right? You can fall forward and the handles are very hard. So what will end up happening is you'll have like a punk, like a internal bleeding from the handlebar injury that just goes God. straight in. So it's dangerous. Yeah. The PSA is please be careful yeah. and always wear a helmet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, the the common, you know, they like to think of our EM doctors as adrenaline drunkies. Yeah. Um, which I don't really 
think is a fair assessment. Yeah. I think we need to stay calm under pressure and we're just under a lot of pressure. Yeah. So we're not really adrenaline junkies. It's just more of, do we know how to navigate chaos? Yeah. And we throw ourselves in chaos because that's just what we do for work. So, I mean, a lot of us like, like action lifestyles. Action but stuff. What do you think are the char- characteristics of someone that would excel as like an emergency medicine doctor? So have you seen that show called like Bear on Hulu? I think? Bear, I don't think so. Or uh, it's, it's a show about like a line cook. No, I haven't. No, no, no. Like a line cook. Yeah. Like someone like who cook. is like able to function with expert precision while everyone is yelling at you. Yeah. I mean, I see the the poster behind you. Gordon um, Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay. Love him. Like, imagine if you can work and do expert culinary work while yeah. someone like Gordon Ramsay is yelling at you. And that Gordon Ramsay could be your patient. It could be your colleague. It could be your nurse. <laughs> it could be your consultants. <laughs> and if you are able to do all of that, like, if you can do all that while well, there's like six Gordon Ramsay's yelling at the same time and the oh hospital's in code God. red is on fire, and like then, then you're fine. Like yeah. if you can do all of that and and handle that amount of stress, you're think about emergency medicine. Okay, that's interesting. Gordon Ramsay, I'm going to think of emergency medicine. So if you're a, a third year medical student or a uh-huh. second year medical student and you're interested in emergency medicine but you don't know much about it. What is a way to learn more about emergency medicine or decide for yourself if this specialty is for you or not? So for the third-year medical students who do not have a core EM rotation, I would ask the dean or whoever your dean is and say, is there someone within an who has an academic role in emergency medicine department and ask to shadow or ask for more additional information. There are EM mentors on websites like Emra or Cord who provide mentorship for students who do not have, or for, for medical students, what do we call them, orphan students, for students who are in an institution without an EM like rotation or without an EM clerkship at all. So they can reach out to them and they will provide you with Zoom mentorship. Or yeah, so it is out there. It's really great. I, I recommend it. A few of my friends do it. What is it? Is there? A, is it a link? A website? A Google search? Um, we can. I can show you the link afterwards. But Got this it. essentially is, um, the, the the council of program directors in emergency medicine that we have our own like, you know, special mentorship. I group see. Okay. For okay. students who do not have access to mentors. Got in fact, it. Got it. I think I actually mentored someone's significant other whose program, whose school did not have a program because her spouse was a student at Jefferson. It was yeah. like really confusing. Yeah, but yeah. I was like, but I I also offer like mentorship as well. And sometimes yeah. you just need someone who's in the field to give you Got recommendations. It. Got it. Um if you are interested in emer- if you're interested in any field, and this is beyond emergency medicine, just spend a day or two you know, um, go there, talk to people, see what it's like. Um, you know, I trained as an engineer and a biomedical engineer and mechanical engineer. And when I started in medicine, aside from family medicine, I thought maybe I could dabble in orthopedics. Orthopedics is very fun. It's very hard to get into. And it could incorporate and in, uh, some of the knowledge that I gained as a mechanical engineer and I could leverage my skills to be both an inventor, a scientist, and also a doctor. So I thought it was like the perfect uh, opportunity. And I actually shadowed a few orthopedic surgeons. And in one of my experiences, I, I shadowed this dynamic orthopedic surgeon couple. Couple? And, couple, oh. yeah. And one memorable conversation I had, I'm paraphrasing it, is... Neither of those two had any idea what's going on with their kids. They they had people they, they uh-huh. to to take care of them Manage, and all this. Yeah. They were not being neglectful parents. Yeah, no, they were being I, wonderful yeah. parents. Uh-huh. But they're just like you know we're so busy we just don't get to spend as much time with them because we're both here in clinic right now, and or they switch off every once in a while. And I remember that and said to myself, is this a a lifestyle that I wanted, where I just physically can't see my children as much. 
And it wasn't until that interaction that I crossed off orthopedics from the list of like potential like job opportunities. Mm-hmm. Or- so definitely get some experience, do some shadowing or something like that. Don't, yeah, I would say really, you really have to go because when yeah. you look for external validation, you're really looking for things you want to hear. It's like reading the news. It's like it's your it's your natural Facebook algorithm yeah. where you're only going to listen to things that you want to listen to. Yeah. And you're going to shun away things you don't want to hear. Yeah. But being there in person makes you confront those things in real life. And you might have, you might make new discoveries that you would have never known. Yeah. Yeah. For emergency medicine, are there anything, where do you think the future of emergency medicine? Are there exciting things to you? Maybe specifically what your research is or or anything like t- maybe telehealth. Do you think it's going to go more telehealth? Is there anything exciting in the future of emergency medicine for you? In terms of emergency medicine, so for the future of, I guess, my 10, 15, 30 year career plan that, you know, my interest currently is on implicit bias, um, diversity and inclusion, also procedural training. So that's kind of where my, I'm an, I'm an educator at heart. Mm-hmm. I just love emergency medicine. Um, I have no idea what emergency medicine as a whole is going to look like in, in the next few decades. Uh, I don't know how it's going to be staffed. I don't know whether there's going to be more emphasis on a hybrid model, more urgent cares, more telemedicine. Um, I, I genuinely don't know. Mm-hmm. I think COVID has, for better or for worse, made us consider different ways of seeing the doctor aside from just in the in the regular office setting. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. But I don't it, think we can be outsourced for a while. Yeah. No, I think that'd be tough. It'd be tough to outsource yeah. us. We're, we're still, we still have to be there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even though I, I, but I guess this is more internal medicine. I've heard, I've seen these hospital from home companies coming up. They're interesting. They're interesting where you have a, um, you have uh, like a pulse ox, you have uh, something like a, like one of those, like a, like a 12 lead or something like that. Um, and you have like automated blood testing and these kind of things. And it would all report to a central system. And the doctor, the attending physician would do their rounds on the patient via going through all these things and stuff like that. And then decide whether or not, like for example, a patient who's, you know, got congestive heart failure and really they just need to get the Lasix to get the fluid off or something like that and say they've established this is the reason they need to do it. Maybe they just need to get the Lasix and be at home and, and that's the only thing they're doing and they don't really need to be in the bed in the hospital. This is conjecture from my side, by the way, at this point. But the, and but I don't know. This, they're just interesting, interesting things. Do you think hospital from home is a possibility or no? Sounds like you just gave primary medicine another thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. you're right. Oh, you're right. I think you just gave them another list of oh, things God, to do to primary, review. There's primary doctors. They, they are... The saints. Uh, they are saints. Next to my social workers and case managers, a huge shout out to those guys and gals. Any advice for people to have a successful, and this isn't generally necessarily emergency medicine, long-term career in medicine? And could, this could be anything. This could be lifestyle. This could be finances. This could be family. This could be personal wellness. This could be anything. <sighs> I mean, I have this statement that I think it's going to be um, some of my viewers may not agree. Um, I always find that when people talk about medicine as a career, they feel shy about disclosing the income as a reason to why they're doing medicine. And I still feel ambivalent about whether you should address it or not. I, I think it's an important consideration of why you chose a specific field. I don't think you should hide it from people mm-hmm. of why you chose it. I think in reimbursement models for for better or for worse and whether the U.S. is doing the right way, that's not the point of this conversation. But I think you should look at it meaningfully and say, I chose it because I worked really hard and this has a respectable reimbursement model. And I think that's important because mm-hmm. I would like to do this. Yeah, And I think we as adults should be able to have adult conversations like that. Yeah. So one of my recommendations to people is to say, look, if you're interested in the field because it has high reimbursement models, just own up to it. Yeah, You don't have to deny it. You're just mm-hmm. like, go for it. Yeah. Um, what was the other thing that you said? That was it. So it was just a general question. It could be, it could be career, like how mm-hmm. to make sure you have a successful 
quote unquote career in whatever field you're in, how to make sure you have a successful home life or family, mm -hmm. uh, how to make sure you have a successful lifestyle. So this could be wellness, this could be hours in the hospital versus hours at home or or anything. So you mentioned you talked about the finances. Um, yeah. You don't have to answer the other ones. Or just yeah, I mean, I would say that. It's hard. I, I still consider myself as a younger faculty yeah. with younger children at yeah. home. Um, you know, I think if you are in a relationship and there's a significant other in your life, really listen to your significant other. I think this is just a life comment. Like, listen to them because, you know, my wife altered her practice patterns so I can do what I do. And... I won't be able to do what I do or I cannot do what I do without her support. So I think that's one of the re realism is that if you are going to go become a dean, become the chair, you need someone to help fill in the part that you're not that you're not devoting your time on. So I think no matter what kind of medicine or whatever dream you have, if you have someone there to support you, please cherish them. So shout out to my wife Maureen who is probably taking care of my daughter right now. Um, but yeah, I would say that's probably my recommendation is that if you have someone there to look look out for you, please consider their wellness um, as an integral element for your wellness. Do you have any long-term goals? Do you want to be a dean? Do you want, where's, where does the future of Dr. Zhang look like? You know, dean would be pretty nice. Yeah. I have to learn the ropes of deanship, yeah. Yeah. but um, that would be nice. Yeah. I think I like to really expand myself, not just within emergency medicine, but just medical education in general. And I've done a few fellowships, learned some of the the fundamentals of education, especially in adult learning. And who knows? Who knows yeah. where I would be 10, 15 years? Yeah. Hopefully with more sleep. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> I hope so more sleep. Um, now, the question I ask everyone that comes in, and this is kind of a really random question, but books. Are there any books that you think medical students or people in the healthcare field should read? Are there any books that have had a particular impact on you or anything like that? You know, people always mention, what do people always say? They always say uh, The House of God. Mm -hmm. People say uh, When Breath Becomes Air. What do, what do other people say? I don't have any of the books right there. I was trying to see if I could find one. So I forgot what the other one is where something when when something falls down or something oh things fall up no that's that's an old high school or oh gosh if I had the power of the internet I would be able to tell you no it's okay um you know I like the house of God yeah and I like scrubs yeah which obviously is not a book not a book but you know um I like house of God because I think there's there's there are many ways to look at it is to say is to reciprocate all the things that they said in that book, which you know certainly can be done. But the other part is, I think it's a keen observation of how burnout can occur. And I think that book serves more as a warning sign of when, when do these things become not funny and real? I think throughout the course of my training, there are elements in which I lived that book, which I felt emotions that are not healthy or patient-centered as an early trainee or as an early attending. And I think having remember what that book was about and recognizing burnout for myself is when I said, this is not good, this is not healthy. I'm treating patients in a way that I wouldn't want wanted to be treated. And those changes might be subtle for me and other people who, you know, in those situations have... Um, they would say, what are you talking about? You were fine. You were perfectly professional. But I know I had crossed the line that I didn't want to. And I think it's, and I, that's why I like that book. Mm -hmm. Because it, it's a warning sign of how the job can consume you. And you're more than just a job. So I really like the book. And Scrubs is just great. Scrubs is great. And I love Scrubs great. too. It's a good, is it, do you think it's, this is a question, I haven't asked this question before, but what do, you, do you think it's the most realistic TV show in regards to medicine? So I think it's the most realistic. T I don't actually watch too many yeah. hospital shows and I've actually never watched ER. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, right? <laughs> but I will say it's highly accurate in a satirical way. And I yeah. believe that that show was based on the Miriam Hospital where I trained in Rhode Island. And wow. I think it's, I you know, this could be completely false information. So please someone out there correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. But I believe that 
one of the creators actually interviewed one of uh, his roommate who was a resident at the Miriam Hospital and got most of the details of that show from that resident's just day-to-day life. Wow. That's so, interesting. So that's 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 what I was told. Yeah. I, I haven't I think I looked it up at some point, but yeah. as I said, in this day and age, don't trust anything you hear, just confirm it. On the internet, exactly. And in a verified source. A verified source. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything you wish you did differently on your journey to becoming an attending? This could be going through medical school. This could be going through residency. This could be in your first five years of being a faculty member. If I just one thing I can say, and I know this is oxymoronic, I wish I could tell the med students just take it easy. Um, I think they're learning so much more than I did when I was a medical student. And they are expected to do so many things beyond medical school that the pressures are just higher than they've ever been before. I think as a different generation, I have, you know, I was, when I was, <laughs> when I was a medical student. <laughs> wasn't too long wasn't ago. Wasn't too long ago. We read books mm. with physical Paper. trees, right? Trees yeah. were in my hands. Those are just for pictures. I never looked at those. Yeah. Nowadays, students have access to like videos that tell them what to read and and all these flashcards and all these crazy new things. And I think with all those options, they're just, there's so much that they have to consume. There's an increased pressure for them to all do something different and unique aside from just being unique themselves. Um, and I kind of just want to tell med students, like it's okay to relax every once in a while. Like remember your wellness. You know, I think... Just remember that you're a normal person and that things will be different. It'll be it will be different once mm-hmm. you're a residency, but just take it a little bit easier. Do you have any specific advice for uh, medical students considering a career in emergency medicine? Get a mentor now. Get a mentor now. Yeah. yeah. I think because my job as a mentor is not to push you towards emergency medicine, but to offer you every opportunity to succeed should you apply to emergency medicine. And it never hurts to get a mentor early on in life. Um, Based on how emergency medicine is looking right now, we we have never been historically a field that worry too much about research. So it's not a field where you need to publish six papers before you start considering a field in emergency medicine, which I know is true for some of the other more competitive Mm -hmm. uh, specialties. But you know, the whole concept of talk to talk to a mentor. See if we're the right field for you. See if you want to consider whether this lifestyle is appropriate for you and your family and that, you know, you have the grades that it takes for you to do what it is that we do. Mm-hmm. So I think having a mentor is probably the best. Find a mentor. Do you have any closing words? Anything you want to mention? Anything you want to bring up? Any final messages or anything like that you want to say? I think one of my... F- final words is remember that you're there for your patients. You are as an ER, as an emergency medicine physician, I'm kind of like the first and last person that the patient might see for a while. And you only have a few minutes to make an impression. And that might be true for a lot of specialties as well, but make it a good impression, you know, Sometimes when they've waited for you for 10, 8 to 12 hours, they don't want to see someone who's burnt out. You know, they don't want to see someone who's labored, who's you know, ridden with baggages. They want to see a supportive face. Just, you know, be positive, be happy. Listen, active listen. And I think that would make the difference. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. I really appreciate you appearing, and I think this was really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Cool. Perfect. Awesome. That was fantastic.